Epilogue Dean was in the castle orchard petting Blueness and Scrap one last time when Mora found her. The girl's eyes were red and puffy. I wish you weren't leaving, she commented and sniffed. Dean smiled. You'll hardly know I'm gone. You've been that busy, what with Belden's funeral and working things out so the ogres have farms and all. But once the king sends me a guardian, I won't be busy. Of course you will. To con the animals already said they'll deal with no one but you. You're the only noble in Tortle with the basilisk, ogres, bats, wolves, and squirrels as advisors on running a fife, not to mention a golden eagle. Shading her eyes, she looked at the tower. Branches protruded from the window of Tristan's workroom. It had been specially widened so Hunsong could use it as a nest. Don't forget Blueness and Scrap, Mora petted the cats gently. Cats aren't special advisors. They advise us all the time, whether we want them to or not. Dane gently tugged at her friend's hair. I'll visit, I promise. After the big cold, though. Twelve years I lived through mountain winters because I had no choice. That's enough. But winter here is beautiful, protested Mora. The lake's all hard for skating, and the trees look like they have sugar frosting. Dane shivered. Ugh, enough. You're too good at describing. Will you write? Tell me what you're doing, and Kitten, and Numer. I'm not very good at writing letters, Dane said. The wistful look in the other girl's huge brown eyes made her sigh. I'll try. Honest. Most of their friends, Aikaju, Mora, Tate, the dogs, Blueness, and Scrap, accompanied Dane, Numer, Kitten, and their mounts to the edge of the village and stopped there. Dane gave Mora and Aikaju a hug and petted each of the dogs. The cat stood their farewells to Kitten as Dane took Tate aside. No more wolf hunting? she asked him. No need to, since Brofane promised they'd leave the farm animals alone. The huntsman tweaked her nose. Where in guide your aim, lassie? Take care of those dogs, and Mora. Taka, who carried Kitten, and Flicker, who rode with Dane, stayed with them as a small company of horses and humans took the road south. Each time Dane or Numer looked back, the others were still there, watching until the road along the lakeshore took them from sight. Kitten whistled unhappily. She and the cats had become good friends in the three weeks since the capture of Yolaine. Taka murmured to her and Dragon. Silently appearing from the trees, the long lake pack fell in step with the travelers. Once the champion and the soldiers had taken their captive south for trial, the wolves had left the populated areas. They had returned to their former habits now that they had an understanding with the valley's humans. Dismounting from Cloud, Dane walked among her friends, sharing their thoughts one last time, though she fought to keep her shape her own. Changing to wolf form had taken its toll. She had lain in bed for several days, drinking nasty herbal teas Numer gave her to ease the pain in all her bones. It would be a long time before she tried a full shapeshift again. When she did, she hoped her skeleton would be more accustomed to such changes. For now, she walked in a universe of keen smells and sounds, shared with her by her pack. They stopped to eat lunch near the spot where the southern fort had once stood. It was a ruin. No buildings were left inside the blackened remains of the wall. Dane eyed the destruction, awed. Cakes of flour did this? Flour heated under pressure explodes, replied Numer. They had gotten supplies for the entire valley the day before the barrier came down. Mora couldn't have done better if she'd burned kegs of blasting powder. Shaking her head, Dane looked at the empty stockade where Blackthorn and his mercenaries had stayed until being taken south with Yolaine. With advance warning of their arrival, the King's Own and the Riders had captured Tristan's allies with no bloodshed and only a little magical assistance from Numor and the Lioness. Now all that remained to show that mercenaries had come to Dunlath was this rough and empty fenced yard. Flicker shared Dane's lunch, handling food gingerly with his left forepaw. It had been nearly severed in the fight at this fort when the squirrel stopped a stormwing from killing Tate. Dane had saved the paw, but nothing she could do would ease the tenderness in the bone. Now she let him go through her pockets one last time. His raiding done, Flicker pressed a cold, wet nose to hers. His whiskers tickled. It was fun, he said. We had excitement before the big cold. We fought evil. My kits will know it, and their kits, and every other squirrel in Dunlath through all of time. I know. I don't suppose you'd want to come with us, then. No, he replied. Somebody has to tell Mora how us rodents feel, and the mice won't do it. They're too afraid of blueness and scrap. 
Take care of yourself, she said, wiping her eyes on her sleeve. You're getting as many lives as a cat, you know. He gave her a last squirrel kiss, then allowed Taka to pick him up and put him in his pouch. Take care of my young cousin, the basilisk said in his whispery human voice. Do not let her eat so many potatoes and cookies. She is getting fat. Dane smiled at him, lips quivering a little. Watch over our friends. Don't let the humans bully the people the way they did before we came. I doubt the people will allow them to do so, Taka assured her. He touched her cheek gently and bowed to Numer. I shall visit when things are settled here, he promised. Numer smiled at the basilisk. I'll collect rocks for your welcome feast. Taka nodded, he had expected no less, and set off along the road to the village. Before they were gone from view, Dane saw the squirrel climb onto the top of the basilisk's head, where he could see better. Kitten chirped softly as Dane's eyes spilled over once more. Goodbyes are sad things, Numa remarked, voice soft. That is why wolves don't say them, commented Fleetfoot as Dane translated. I always knew your kind was smarter than mine, the man replied, smiling. We knew that too, agreed Short Snout, making Dane giggle. Enough moping, she said, getting up. Let's move on. They had reached the wide cleft where river and road left Dunlath, the spot where Tristan had planned to dump blood rain, when a flash of white on a nearby ledge caught Dane's eye. A giant white wolf stood there, calmly watching them. Brokefang? she asked. Didn't you say there are no other wolves here? That is Old White, Brokefang replied. The patch behind him, which looks like a shadow, is his mate, Night Black. Calling on a deeper level of her magic, she looked again. When she found Old White and Night Black, they were blazes of silver fire, the same kind of fire that shone from her mentor, the Badger. She touched the silver claw at her throat. I hope you're happy with all this, she called. Just don't blame me if the people aren't as obedient to you gods as they were before you brought me in to teach them things. Who were you talking to? Numerous question made her look at him. Old White, she said. He's up there, him and his mate. She pointed to the ledge, but the wolf gods had vanished. They were there. Checking for the long lake pack, she found that they too had disappeared in a more normal way, fading into the trees that grew on the mountainside. Good hunting, she called to them. From the shadows under the trees, she heard her friends wish her the same. Numer tousled her hair. Let's go home, Majelet.